keep it in. Okay, great. Uh, hello, everyone. Again, um, I'm Josh Fitzgerald. Um, we have started the meeting recording. So thank you all for joining us uh, for this, our final Lent term Garrett research seminar for the Cambridge Department of Archaeology and the McDonald Institute for Archaeological Research. I'm uh, Dr. Joshua Fitzgerald, an ethno historian and current JRF with Churchill College in Cambridge. Uh, Oliver Anchek and I have co-organized this series, The North Atlantic Highway, Materiality and Mobilities Throughout Europe, Africa, and the Americas, to reflect upon the theme of mobilities and migrations with leading experts in archaeology, socioanthropology, history, and museum and cultural heritage studies. Today, we round out the series uh, focus on the North Atlantic with a presentation by uh, Professor Matthew Johnson and added seminar closing commentary from Pitt Professor Teresa Singleton. Uh, Oliver and I uh, do hope you've enjoyed this series and we encourage you to uh, review those talks that you may have missed over the course of the term uh, via the uh, Cambridge Archaeology YouTube channel, which we'll post a link to that in the chat uh, in, uh, later on. Uh, before I introduce today's speaker, let me just cover the basics of the Zoom meeting. It's a sort of uh, form uh, for everyone sort of aware of these notes, but I'll just read them off. Um, some of our guidelines. First, this meeting is being recorded for educational purposes, and we ask that you mute your microphone at this time and leave it, uh, keep it muted throughout the uh, talk. Um, we may, or you may leave your video feed enabled should you prefer that, but. Um, that is with the understanding that you are agreeing to be recorded for the, the educational purposes. Also, the closed captioning Zoom feature has been enabled, um, and you should be able to uh, turn that on. Um, uh, we do not uh, have any say in how Zoom auto generates these te this text, so just keep that in mind. Uh, Professor Johnson will speak for 50 minutes, and during that period, the chat feature will be turned off to avoid any distractions. Following that time, we'll turn that feature back on. We'll turn to you, the audience, and, and we'll have an engaging question and answer portion uh, with our guest. And uh, that'll be facilitated by Oliver. Um, you'll be able to use the raise hand feature uh, found under the reaction button. And then Oliver will call on you. You'll ask, ask your question or make your comment. And, and we'll go from for that. Uh, we'll move for that for about 15 minutes. And then after that point, we'll turn to uh, Professor Singleton for her commentary on the uh, series and the research related to the themes of the talks that we've had throughout this this term. Uh, the McDonald Institute strives to provide a thought-provoking and inclusive space for exchanges of ideas and research. All of our attendees must respect the invited speakers and fellow attendees and, and know that any disrespectful commentary or offensive behavior will result in that offending party being removed from the virtual room. Thank you very much. Uh, now, I have the honor of introducing today's speaker, Professor and Associate Dean Matthew Johnson. Matthew works on the archaeology and history of Europe and the Atlantic world. He has written six books on a range of themes, including castles, traditional houses, landscape, and an archaeology of capitalism. His best known book is an introduction to archaeological theory. He has also written more widely on interdisciplinary and interpretive approaches, understanding medieval and historical archaeology and archaeology in its cultural context. He most recently worked in, in the field at Bodium Castle and nearby houses and landscapes in southeastern England. Bodium is an iconic site termed a fairy tale castle by visitors. It has been a classic study in debates over society and culture in the later medieval uh, Middle Ages. The collaborative Anglo-American project explored the castle and its surroundings as a living landscape of people of different and social classes and identities. Places like Bodium are best understood as a series of scales ranging from the action of washing hands in the chapel piscina through to their setting within global and post-colonial networks. Matthew was born in Austin, Texas, and is a dual U.S.-British citizen, so bridging the Atlantic. He has held visiting fellowships and positions at UC Berkeley, Heidelberg University, UCLA, Flinders University, University of Cambridge, and the University of Pennsylvania. After a PhD at Cambridge and posts at Sheffield, and Durham and Southampton, he returned across the Atlantic in 2011 to be professor and sometime chair of anthropology and associate dean of the Weinberg College of Arts and Sciences at Northwestern University. 
He is writing a book on the archaeology of the English in the Atlantic world in the second millennia CE. He tra uh, traces material landscapes and identities from the English Middle Ages through the feudal systems of Wales, Scotland, and Ireland to the plantations and colonies of New England, Virginia, and the Caribbean. His aim is to explore the landscapes, buildings, and objects that people made and used and how these were bound up with the changing identities of the English and their neighbors over the very long durée or long term. Uh, now, okay, we'll go ahead and welcome, uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Matthew for his talk and you can, the floor is yours, you can share your screen now. Perfect. Okay, well, thank you very much um, for that very kind introduction. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me today. Um, I should thank Professor Singleton for initiating, concluding and providing the inspiration for this series of talks. And I'd particularly like to thank everybody for coming to this virtual event. It's, it's uh, great to see so many old friends and colleagues and indeed quite, quite touching to see uh, several of my former teachers and mentors in the audience today. Um, the, the series theme is uh, the North Atlantic Highway, and the series theme um, refers to mobilities and immobilities, uh, a complex cultural mosaic, and, and more broadly, um, uh, themes of hybridity, creolization, ethnogenesis, circulation, performance, and movement. What I want to do in this talk is to start off by thinking a little bit about the tension then. And I see this as a tension, particularly in studies of the early modern Atlantic world. Um, uh, between, but, but actually a very old and enduring tension within, within archaeological thought as, as a whole, that we're very good at thinking about long-term structures. We're very good at thinking about um, regions, environments. We're very good at thinking about, about fixed features in the landscape, such as, such as buildings. At the same time, the whole thrust of much of archaeological and social cultural theory in the last 20, 30 years has been to, to move in the other direction, to think about how things change very, very quickly, to think about how identities are shifting and fluid and, and, and unstable. And you see this in the historiography of the Atlantic world. Um, there are origin stories that are traditional, that um, are very powerful and enduring, and that keep going however much more recent work has tended to, to, to move on from them or to, to, to put question marks against them. I think here of the work of, of people like David Hackett Fisher, Albion Seed, um, uh, a book which again was, it has been much, much criticized in the way it locates um, the origins of particular regional cultures in North America within particular regional cultures in, um, uh, in, in, in England. So it identifies uh, Pur Puritan culture of New England as coming from East Anglia, uh, the, 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 the traditions of, of Virginia coming from, from the West Country and, and so forth. Um, but for all this criticism, it's more or less repeated with, with additional um, uh, regional identities, national identities by Colin Woodard in his very recent New York Times bestseller, American Nations. And again, ideas such as Jim Deese's that, that the, the Puritan settlers of New England carried what he calls a precious cargo, um, uh, which he says is between their ears, the culture of old England, or the same idea, but flipped and reversed. Um, Philip Deloria talking about um, the settlers of Plymouth Plantation being a, being, being a warrior tribe. So one of the things I'm going to come back to again and again today is the way in which many of these older and enduring ideas are ideologically freighted. As much as we try and move away from them, we come back to them immediately. There's a constant backwards and, and forwards. Now I'm going to explore this, at least initially, not through 
giving you an extended theoretical peroration. I'm sure you're very pleased to hear that, but rather by exploring two case studies. I'm going to talk first about a particular artifact, a sundial at St. Peter's Church in Torstock in the uh, southwest of England. And I'm going to go on and much more briefly uh, talk for maybe just five minutes or so about uh, uh, the other extreme of England, southeast England. I'm going to talk about Bodiam Castle, uh, where, as, um, uh, as Josh indicated, um, I've been doing field work for, for, for some time. So I'm going to talk about these two case studies, and I'm going to try and ask what kind of theoretical lessons can, can, we, can we draw from them. Let's start off then with, with, with this, this specific artifact. This is sundial, it's affixed to the south porch of Torstock Church in North Devon. It has the date of 1757, um, made by uh, J. John or James Berry. Um, the design is clearly highly distinctive. It's made of several pieces of slate, probably from Wales, and it's, it's surrounded by a, by a moulded frame. It has the motto on it, watch and pray, time steals away. This is a very common quote um, uh, with different wordings. It's often, uh, it's often rendered in Latin as vigilante et orate tempus fugit. And um, perhaps most significantly, it's given in a book dated 1753, uh, just a few years, uh, sorry, I do apologize, 1756, just a few, uh, just a, a, a year before, before the, the sundial is laid out. This is a book by, by Ledbetter. It's entitled Mechanic Dialing or the New Art of Shadows, fed, uh, freed from many of the obscurities, fluid superfluities and errors of former writers on this subject. And the, the, the motto is given as number 270, as in the list of 100 possible mo mot uh, mottos you might put in your, your sundown. Now, I'd like to focus on the reference locations. Um, as you can see, particularly with the ones at the top, these are a combination of co colonial ports from the Atlantic world and beyond, European cities, and also biblical references. So we have Fort St. George, which is at Madras, now Chennai, Samarkand, Babylon, Jerusalem, Rome, Lisbon. We have Barbados, uh, settled by the English uh, around in the 1620s. You have Boston, um, named by Puritans in the 1630s, um, uh, 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 named after the Boston in, in, in Lincolnshire, not so distant from Cambridge. You have Port Royal listed, um, though in fact that had been destroyed by an earthquake in 1692 and replaced by what is now the modern city of, uh, of Kingston in Jamaica. And coordinates for all these places are given in the book by Ledbetter as discussed. Now clearly this is in part copied out, but clearly also whoever designed this understood global navigation. The tropics of Cancer and Capricorn are there. And it's been placed here at the midpoint of a process in the 18th century of determining longitude, determining a method for um, determining longitude while at sea. Um, this is of some historiographic significance as well as practical in terms of understanding the history of the 1700s and understanding navigation in the 1700s, because once that's sorted out, many um, hist historians, many scholars have argued that this is the end point of what can be termed a distinctive Atlantic world, that after this, there's, um, that, that after this you have to place in the context of these other worlds. More about that in a second. So how do we understand this artifact? How do we think about it? Um, how, do we, um, uh, how, how do we understand what it, what it means? Well, the first move I want to make is to place it in context. And I want to place it in context a series of scales. First of these scales is the church itself. Um, it's on the south um, porch of, um, of, of Torstock Church 
you'll see immediately um, that uh, for a small rural settlement like Torstock, this is a larger church than you would expect. And as you go in and around um, the church, you uh, quickly figure that there is something very particular about this place. Because as you go around the interior of it, it is stuffed with tombs. It is uh, stuffed with, with bodies um, not entirely dissimilarly to a Neolithic chambered tomb. It is quite difficult to move from one end to the other because of all the memorials to two elite families that you find here. The older memorials are to the Borchia family, um, the later ones are to the Rays. And along with these tombs are a whole series of fixtures and fittings um, uh, designed in part to fix certain ideas of social status within the spatial pattern of the church. What we're looking at here is an Anglo-Protestant arena. We're looking at an established Church of England, which in the 17th and 18th centuries seeks to fix social relations in part by where people um, are, are placed with, within the church. And you see this very directly and literally. You see it on the walls as well. Um, uh, people going to church in this space and remember that before 1670s um, there was a legal compulsion to, 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 to attend um, Anglican worship. Um, the walls are, 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 are inscribed with, with, with the, the acts of charity which these members of the elite families are giving to the poor. So it's not just the tombs, it's the whole thing. And the theme is repeated outside. Some of these tombs, these, 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 these monuments are outside. On the right, you can see there's actually a mounting block um, so that, um, again, uh, members of the elite coming up to this church, arriving and leaving on horseback, could do so and, and alight from their, 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 their horses um, uh, with some, some measure of, of dignity, while deference was shown to them by the, the, the commoners, commoners around. So the church is an arena for a certain kind of set of social relationships. But the church is also very old. Um, it's likely um, that the fabric of the church is at least seven centuries old at the point the sundial is affixed to it. Um, you see traces in the fabric, the um, uh, uh, sculptures like this, the mouldings, many of the architectural details clearly go back to the 12th and the 13th centuries. And it's probable that the parts of the fabric of the church actually go back into the, into, into the pre-conquest period. So the point I'm seeking to establish here, this isn't just an arena for a certain kind of set of social relations, it's also a very old building. And it's a building that has to be set in context. Those, member, those members of the gentry family, the Borchers and the Rays, who um, uh, um, alighted from the mounting block didn't actually have very far to, to ride. This picture is taken from the same vantage point as the one of the church early. They had maybe four or five hundred metres to ride. Now, the present house on this site is actually later. It dates to the 1780s. It itself is an artefact of colonialism. The, uh, the builder of this house married an heiress from the, um, from the East India Company. So what you're looking at is an artifact of, 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 of capital, of finance, in, in this case, from the East Indies. There are a few fragments that are left of the earlier house, um, most notably uh, a gatehouse off to one side in late medieval form, twin towers, battlements, but with the um, addition, the, with, with, with a classical pediment um, uh, directly above the, uh, the arch. So I'm sketching for you a place that, um, uh, that is, is, is an estate landscape. Here is a view from the air. Here is the church. Here is the house. And you'll see beyond and to the left, um, a series of houses. This is an estate village. The houses you're seeing there date from the 1700s, 1800s. They're actually relatively recent and surrounding this as well, banks of deliberately planted trees. So this is an estate landscape and it's being laid out at some point 
around about the, the rebuilding of the, 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 the house and, and um, a generation earlier, the place in the sundial. It's being laid out to 18th century aesthetic principles of what a state landscape should look like. These principles endure and they go on and they are also deployed in colonial contexts. In the very first talk in this series, um, Professor Singleton showed us this image, um, an image which is clearly ideologically phrased, an image from the first decades of the 19th century from missionary papers relating to Sierra Leone. And you see the depiction of this landscape in terms of a church, in terms of a settled village, a stream running through the, the middle, and banks of houses, uh, sorry, banks of trees um, around this as well. So a common set of aesthetic principles um, in, uh, that are then deployed in colonial contexts, or more accurately in this context, deployed in depictions of colonial contexts, arguably for consumption by a white audience, whether in North America or in, 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 in the British Isles. But you have this estate landscape, and it is placed down within the interstices of a much older landscape still. Here is the church, here is the, um, uh, here is the, here, here is the great house, you can see the, the village beyond. Beyond that though, um, you have a series of isolated farmsteads, and you have a series of um, patches of woodland, and you have a series of irregular fields. This, of course, is a classic North Devon landscape. The essential pattern you're seeing here in terms of its dispersed nature, in terms of the field boundaries, is one of very great antiquity. Many of these fields will go back to the, the 1100s, 1200s, to the um, to the, to, the, to the expansion into, um, in, 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 into the bocage of, the, of that, that, that period. It may very well be that many elements of this landscape are actually much older still. The origins of this state itself may go back at least well into the early med medieval period, if not before. Many of these field boundaries may well be ancient and may well actually go back into late, later prehistory. So you're dealing with a landscape here that is, is, is in many elements very, very ancient. And you're dealing with a landscape which is always and immediately ideologically freighted. Um, Hoskins, of course, W.G. Hoskins uh, came from Devon and at the, around about the same time he was publishing The Making of the English Landscape, he was publishing his guide to, um, to the county. Um, and here is what he has to say about these kinds of landscapes. This is the immemorial provincial England, stable, rooted deep in the soil, unmoving, contented, and sane. But let's zoom out a little bit and let's look at this unmoving, contented, and sane landscape in a slightly wider context. You can see Torstock marked on the map on the left here, and you'll see it is in direct proximity to the two ports of Barnstaple and Biddeford. Now, if you were seeking to actually travel from London to North America, or indeed to the Caribbean, um, in, the, uh, in the 1600s and 1700s, you may well have known these places. If you were poor or you couldn't, you couldn't afford it, you would get a ship, a boat from, from London. Um, but you would waste a lot of time beating your way up against prevailing westerlies as you went up the English Channel. If you could afford it, you, got, you went on horseback or you took a coach to a port in Devon, such as Barnsford and Bitterford, or indeed to, uh, to Plymouth um, on, 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 the, on, the, on the southern coast. Um, so, so this is also, and at the same time, a place of mobility. And it's a place from a very early stage of uh, uh, stage in its history of, um, of, of um, 
of, 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 of diversity of different kinds. I showed you the classical detail on the, um, the, the, the gatehouse. We don't know for certain who did this, but we do know that many of these classical details, which are turning up very, very early in Southwest England, are actually done by craftsmen from Brittany. So this is about mobility uh, uh, along the fringes of the Atlantic. We also know that around the same time that the gatehouse was being built in the 1570s, we have the first records of people of African descent in the area. There is a reference to a person of African descent in a will of um, a, a merchant in Barnstable um, from, from precisely this period. And this is not unusual. You find um, this, uh, these, uh, these, these people, these, these, these examples of what um, Professor Singleton calls secondary migration, turning up in Devonports, in, 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 in urban centres in the southwest from the, from the later 16th century onwards. It's also a place with a, a very deep consciousness of the maritime world, and particularly a consciousness of Piracy. Um, Lundy Island, just a few uh, miles off the coast of, um, of, of, of Devon, is a place that was periodically occupied by pirates, some of whom were, um, uh, were engaged in, 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 in the slave trade with, with, with North Africa. And this consciousness of slavery in the Atlantic world is something um, which, which is there again from a very, very early stage. You see it, for example, in the narrative of Captain John Smith, one of the earliest settlers of, of Virginia. Um, he, in his memoirs, um, counterpoints um, his experiences in Virginia, or he prefaces them rather, with, with, with accounts of his, his time as an enslaved person at the Ottoman court in the Mediterranean. There's also a counterpointing in this literature of, of the experience of the Mediterranean world with, with that of the Atlantic world. That's, that's a matter maybe for another day. Um, you find these in Robinson Crusoe. You find the, these, these experiences mentioned in, 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 in Samuel Pepys. So this is um, uh, so to see this as stable and moving, contented and sane is only part of the story of this area. And another part of this, the, the story of this area, uh, and a very important one, is its place as a cultural borderland. Um, Torstock, marked by the red spot on the left is actually um, a place that for uh, hundreds of years was actually on the borderland between the, um, uh, the, 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 the Celtic populations of the West and the expanding state of Wessex to the East. Um, Cornwall was um, eventually absorbed into Wessex but retained a distinctive sense of its own cultural identity and a distinctive sense of itself as being part of um, a, 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 West, a Western zone of settlement um, for a very long time. Um, much of the new British history talks about interactions between England, Ireland, Scotland and Wales. One element it forgets there is, 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 is that Cornwall was part of this as well. Um, Corn, uh, Cornwall was independent until the 10th century. Um, by, the, uh, by the high Middle Ages, um, uh, its distinctive Cornish identity intersected with a, a distinctive class and religious identity as well, and a distinctive cultural identity. Um, the landlords by this period were mostly English speaking and, um, uh, and part, of, part of a Wessex elite. Um, uh, the, um, uh, however, the West Cornish continued to use patronymics well into the 16th century. These people were seen as, as going, um, going bare-legged. They were referred to as red shanks, and you will, many of you will recall the, um, uh, in, um, in Professor Horning's talk um, how uh, this term red shanks and going bare-legged was also seen as part of Irish identity at the period. And of course, it's also an identity you find it with poor white farmers in, in Barbados, where the, 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 term, the term turns up, turns up again. They had their own sports in the form of hurling, and they had their own uh, beliefs, particularly the belief that King Arthur would come again 
uh, during the, uh, the civil wars of the 17th century, this identity uh, was refracted, was translated into support from the king and to an into eventual um, uh, political defeat and absorption. Um, so I've given you a quote at the bottom here, which shows this, <coughs> which I want to use as a lead into thinking about this relationship between um, Western parts of the British Isles and the wider elements of the Atlantic world. This is Roger Williams writing in 1652, um, at the, right at the end of civil wars. Um, we have Indians in Cornwall, Indians in Wales, Indians in Ireland. Now, Williams knew what he was talking about. He was a, uh, he, he lived for some decades in New England. He was a prominent figure in the history of New England, and he lived for a time with uh, the Narragansett uh, tribe. He published the first ever study in English of Native American languages, a book called uh, The Key into the Language of America. Um, uh, which he prefaced with a statement um, uh, um, uh, of support for, 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 for fairer treatment of, of Native Americans and a statement of psychic unity that, that, that these people were, 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 were equals. So he himself is an interesting figure, and here he is drawing a direct link between different elements of what he, uh, what he and his contemporaries called the dark corners of the land, areas distant from London, areas of the north and the west, areas of Wales, Ireland, Cornwall, and Scotland, um, which, um, uh, which are being constructed in a, in a particular kind of way, which are then constructed historiographically as the, the map I've just uh, put up indicates, um, both in terms of allegiance during the, the, the civil wars of the 1600s, in terms of deeper and antecedent structures in terms of the Roman civil zone. Um, and, and, uh, uh, and of course, famously for archeologists, uh, Cyril Fox's division, which I will come back to towards the end of this talk. Okay, um, so that so I want to leave Torstock there, and I will circle back to it towards the end. But I want to very briefly talk about this second case study from southeast England, Bodiam Castle. Now, one of the things we tried to do in our project was break down and problematize the concept of Bodiam as a single phase site. It's generally seen as a site that was built in the 1380s and that was abandoned by the early 17th century. And I want to draw attention to one particular historical phase in the history of this, this actually very, very layered place. And that is its restoration by John Fuller, also known as Mad Jack Fuller in the 1830s. Um, Fuller bought, um, uh, uh, sorry, I should have gone sorry. Fuller bought um, the ruin of Bodian. Um, he spent a great deal of money on it, several hundreds of guineas. It's not quite clear precisely what he did because the accounts talk about, uh, the, his accounts um, uh, list payments to laborers without actually specifying precisely, uh, precisely what, they, what they did. Now Fuller actually owned an estate a few miles, about, about five or 10 miles um, uh, west of Bodian uh, at Brightling. And on this estate, he built a series of follies. He built the oculus that you can see to the left there, which oral tradition states he built specifically so he could go to the top of it and monitor what his workmen were doing at Bodiam, which you can see from that point with a telescope. He, bet he was buried within the pyramids that you can see, again, next to an old church, and he built the sugarloaf you see on the right. And of course, the sugarloaf directly references Fuller's source of income. The Fuller family, through the 1700s and now the 1800s, owned plantations in Jamaica, and um, these plantations were the site of labor for several hundreds of enslaved people. Um, uh, who, who, who work, worked there. Um, Fuller died in 1833, um, uh, but in 1834, the Register of British Slave Owners um, has shown that his, his heirs um, um, uh, were, were compensated for 
um, over um, over two, 200 enslaved people. Um, this has all gone into in more detail in the in the in the absolutely impeccable scholarship of the National Trust report on Bodiam, which which talks about these things. Here is, here is um, Fuller's estate, here is the house at one end, and you can see again the same sort of aesthetic as we've already seen in the layout of this estate around Torstock. Banks of trees, particular features, um, green rolling uh, landscape, hedged fields beyond, so the same sort of aesthetic going on here. Now there's an irony here, and this is slightly off topic for today, but it's, it's something that is of interest, I know to a lot in the audience, so I'll just mention it. As I said, we don't know for sure precisely what Fuller did in this landscape, but given the age of the trees uh, around the castle, it is highly probable that much of its appearance um, is attributable to, to Fuller's intervention. And again, this is a romantic, picturesque, park-like landscape. So there's kind of an irony here in that the whole shift in interpretation of Bodiam from an old soldier's dream, from, from, from a military structure to, to one of being surrounded by, by a formal garden, is in part, I think, conditioned um, and, and made more credible um, or plausible by, by the fact this is how the, the, the landscape was actually, um, was actually redesigned this period. So ironically, much of this shift of interpretation may derive in part from, from an experience actually of an 18th or 19th century landscape, but that is a topic for another day. What I would like to draw attention to is what happens at Bodom in the other direction. I've talked about Fuller in the, in the 1830s. So I also want to make the point that uh, the, the castle itself is actually placed within the interstices of a much older landscape. Here is the castle, here is the church of St Giles, here is the former manor site, which was still occupied um, uh, uh, during the lifetime of the castle. Here is what's referred to as the village, that's really just a row of houses. Here is the site of the medieval harbour, linking Bodiam with the maritime world via the, uh, the, the Romney marshes. And here is the bridge. And um, if you can follow my arrow here, in fact, the bridge marks the junction between this route out to the, to the English Channel and this north-south route of a Roman road. So the castle is a relatively in, a relative interloper in this landscape. It's actually something that's inserted into a much older landscape. And that landscape, uh, this, this landscape is, at the same, is always and immediately ideologically freighted. Where we've seen Hoskins' Devon landscape, here is Conan Doyle's Weald. Uh, the Sussex Weald, um, uh, described um, in this particular Sherlock Holmes story as for 60 years, the bulwark of Britain, which long held the Saxon invaders at bay. So it's a landscape which again is immediately ideologically implicated. So I've given you two case studies um, and you're probably asking the question, that's fine. I see how it works in practice. I see how in practice you, you tack backwards and forwards between mobilities and immobilities. You tack backwards and forwards between um, long-term structures and, 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 and shorter-term shorter arenas of performance. However, how does that work in theory? Well, um, I'm not going to give you a sparkly new theoretical formulation. Instead, what I'm going to do is make two moves that I'm going to characterize as very old school. And that, uh, I'm going to characterize as a return to, uh, tra to, 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 to traditional archeological ways of thinking about things. The first of these is to think about space. I'm going to ask, how do we map this? And I'm going to draw attention to the way in which traditional archaeological maps think about England within the Isles. I prefer the Isles uh, rather than the term the British Isles for the same reasons that Seamus Heaney does. And I'm going to think about that in terms of the creation of Britain and the Britons. The second move I'm going to make is to think about time. 
And again, I'm going to go to that most traditional uh, element of archaeology, stratigraphy, and I'm going to think about layers. And I'm going to argue that both with space and with time, the answers to these tensions between different kinds of structures and identities is actually hiding in plain sight. It is in front, it has been in front of us all this time. Let's start by thinking about space then, and let me show you two distribution maps that cover the aisles as opposed to one particular part of the aisles. On the left, Peter Smith's map from the 1970s of towers and tower houses. You can see a distribution here uh, covering Northern England, Scotland, not Lowland England, not Wales and Ireland. There's a particular distribution within Ireland. On the right, you can see a distribution of mots um, from Derek Wren's work in the late 60s. And again, a particular distribution across eastern Scotland, but not western Scotland, across eastern, uh, uh, the east of Ireland, but not the west of Ireland, across particularly distinctive parts of Wales, including the Little England of Wales and Pembrokeshire in the extreme southwest corner. Now, clearly these maps are telling us something. They're telling us something very interesting. Um, clearly also these maps need to be nuanced. What exactly is a tower? What are, there are different, different definitions. Um, does the map of Mots tell us about ring works as well? How do we think about that? Those, those are very important and valid questions, but I'm drawing your attention here to the big picture. You're also asking, why is Matthew showing me maps that are um, a couple of generations old. Well, um, I want to draw attention to an irony here. We have advanced hugely in terms of our map making and in terms of our understandings of distributions of archaeological material. And we have done this because of certain developments in legislation, for example, the, the Treasure Act and uh, uh, developer funding and, and so forth. Um, and, also, and also at the same time, the digitization of that material. But that has been done within a changing institutional context of devolution, where, thing, where um, uh, 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 managements that used to be done at a level across much of Britain is now devolved to the level of historic England, historic Scotland, Cadw, and in the north of Ireland to the Department for Communities. Consequently, we've produced more and more and better and better maps. Um, so the maps like these, which are actually only, uh, only uh, a few years old, actually look quite, 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 quite primitive now. But uh, their issue is hiding in plain sight. As archaeologists, we are trained to look at the relationship between two phenomena by running a transect across it. We cannot run a transect across, um, uh, across because of the nature of these, these data, particularly for the historic periods. So on our maps, Wales becomes a blank area. Scotland becomes now is not only blank, it's often left off at the top of the maps. And the less said about this curious blob that exists out here somewhere in the middle of the Irish Sea, the better. These maps are technically incredibly proficient, and they are also beautiful. Many of us, certainly I know I do, spend many of our evenings looking at them, simply appreciating um, their beauty and looking for patterns within them. But they all have these um, errors, they, these, I'm oh, sorry, I do not want to use that word. They also have these, these, these emissions. So, what I'm arguing for here is a return to thinking about the aisles as a whole. Um, because, uh, and I'm arguing that some of the issues and the tensions between understanding how these cultural borderlands work lie at the, at the level of the Atlantic world and they lie at the level of map mapping. I want to make it clear there's less to this than meets the eye. I'm not arguing here for regional essentialism. I'm not arguing here that these western and northern areas are in some way ethnically 
different. I'm not trying to get into issues or arguments about Celticism. And I'm not also arguing for, for, for an environmental determinism. I am arguing for a, a, a return to thinking about the Isles as a whole. I put a question mark against internal colonialism there because um, I want to, because uh, I, I do want to return to, to some, some, some form of colonial model at some, some point. Of course, this also, I'm following here, the tradition of the great Cyril Fox. And, um, uh, and in particular, his, his, his uh, uh, classification, his demarcation between a lowland zone to the south and the east and a highland zone to the north and, uh, and the west. So I'm arguing for a return here. But again, I want to draw attention to the way this is immediately ideologically phrased. Fox's work, at least on my reading, uh, he came obviously from a complex um, uh, uh, cultural background, but on my reading is, is primarily about observing patterns and insofar as it has a theoretical um, uh, uh, motor in it, it's one of environmental determinism, though not the rather cruder versions. I think, think some of it, the second generation followers of his work have. But note how it was almost immediately assimilated into other kinds of ideologies. Here, here is Collingwood saying to Fox um, that in fact, a model that on my reading is about envir environment is actually about race. Um, he argues that what Fox is really doing is um, looking at the cross between the poetic, idealistic, and some, somewhat, somewhat slum-minded Celt, and those dry, tough, and persevering low German temperaments of those dyke-bearing pioneers. Um, this is a private letter. Unfortunately, Fox's response to this is not uh, recorded. So I'm overrunning slightly, so I'm going to, I'm going to uh, move forward just a little bit. So, so far I've talked about space. And I've talked about how um, some of these, the, the spatial relationships that we should be interested in, in terms of placing some of these older and enduring structures in the context of the wider Atlantic world, are hiding in plain sight. They're hiding in the problematic relationship between England on the one hand and the Isles on the other hand. I want to uh, uh, make an analogous argument in terms of time. And I again want to argue that certain elements of time have been, uh, so, so certain elements have been hiding in, in plain sight. Possibly the most famous sentence in social theory is this. Uh, people make their own history, but they do not make it just as they please. They do not make it under circumstances chosen by themselves, but under circumstances directly encountered given and transmitted from the past. The tradition of all the dead generations weighs like a nightmare on the brain of the living. This, of course, from Karl Marx, the 18th Brunner of, 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 of Louis Bonaparte. And my hunch is it's, it's the most quoted, most cited um, 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 phrase in, 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 term, in terms of social theory. I suggest that um, when we, when as practicing archaeologists, we stare at the section of an archaeological trench, this is what we are seeing. We are seeing people making their own history, but under circumstances directly encountered, given, and transmitted from the past. And we see this not just in terms of the section of an excavation, we see this in terms of buildings archaeology and the observation of stratigraphy in terms of buildings archaeology. Um, one of the neglected aspects of the history of archaeology, in, in my view, is how our understanding of stratigraphy did not simply or only emerge from geology. It also emerged from the earlier 19th century work of architectural historians seeking to understand and to discriminate, using uh, Rickman's uh, term, um, seeking to understand and, and discriminate um, between different architectural styles. Um, when we see it in the landscape as a whole, we see it in um, the relationship between um, uh, uh, between um, 
uh, um, different elements um, across the, the horizontal landscape. Um, so you don't need physical depth to observe stratigraphy, just as we saw in the landscapes around Torstock and around, um, uh, around, uh, around Bodiam. So to conclude, let me circle back to Torstock. How do we understand, how do we take these ideas about layers and about mapping and about the Atlantic world? And how does this help us understand these kinds of artifacts? Well, again, I want to make a very traditional move. I want to make, uh, I want to talk, I want to move to a traditional archaeological context, namely that of cultural horizon. I suggest the 1700s saw a cultural horizon across the Atlantic world. You see in this period buildings that are classified as Georgian, with symmetrical fronts, classical detail. You see fields that are enclosed, hedged and ditched. Again, Professor Horning in the last talk talked about how these hedged and ditched fields in the north of Ireland are not an artifact of plantation, but actually an artifact of these changes in the later 18th century. Something we see in ceramics and material culture, and perhaps we see it um, uh, in many ways most profoundly in terms of print culture and literacy. I deliberately deferred to uh, the end of the talk the phenomenological question of what would, would the congregation who walked underneath this sundial actually see or understand as they looked up at it? Well, that question is in turn one of uh, levels uh, and numbers of, of literacy. Um, and of course, the sundial itself derives very directly from print culture in the form of, of pattern books. These things all materialize, they uh, um, and mediate a world that is English speaking and a world that is Protestant. The um, creation of this world across the North Atlantic was an active process, and it was done with reference to particular kinds of religious ideas. I'm referring back here to Linda Colley's thesis, which I, I, I largely endorse, that, um, uh, that, 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 great, that Britain is actually a creation or a deliberate political act of union between the Protestant elites of Ireland, Scotland, Wales, and, uh, and England. We see this materially in buildings like the one on the left, and we see layering materially in buildings like the one on the left. This house built by a relatively modest gent in the North Hampshire countryside was built under conditions directly transmitted from the past. You can see on the left here the irregularity, the string course, the different bricks compared to the right. There is an older, more traditional house at the core of this building. This gent in the 1700s nevertheless placed on the front of it or recreated a symmetrical front, a front that a planter from Barbados or from Jamaica would recognize, a front that um, a, a, a member of uh, a, 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 somebody coming from Dublin would realize, and a front that somebody coming from Glasgow would realize, a, fr a front coming from, uh, from that somebody coming from Boston or from Maryland or Virginia would immediately recognize, but under circumstances directly transmitted from the past. The surveyor who laid out the enclosed fields on the right um, engaged in his erasure of earlier agricultural systems, but again under circumstances directly encountered from the past, where the old villages, the old churches, the old routeways were still there, and in which the past nevertheless, if you like, bubbles up and can never totally be erased. So to conclude, um, I've tried to tack backwards and forwards. I've tried to show how we can understand both the mobilities of the Atlantic world and also at the same time, the ancient and enduring structures of the landscape of the Isles um, can be understood in one frame. I've tried to do this by showing how we can make a move not uh, to some fresh theoretical formulation 
but uh, a, re, uh, a re engagement with traditional archaeological concepts. In conclusion, uh, I wonder whether the way forward then is actually to think about writing the past backwards, to move not um, from the medieval world to the modern world, but to do the move in the other direction, just as we excavate sites, just as we excavate, uh, just, just as we dissect landscapes. So to move from the modern England that Collingwood's letter referred to, to the sundial, to what Fuller is doing at Bodian to the medieval antecedents, to understand those in turn, in terms of the infrastructure of the landscape laid down in the earlier Middle Ages and earlier still during the Roman periods and earlier still during the prehistoric periods. And perhaps in fact, the ultimate um, uh, uh, place where we can locate some of our thinking about Atlantic mobilities is actually to work back through the millennia and work back to the time when the Isles were actually connected with the continent uh, in, uh, uh, across, across Dogland. How that, I will not lie to you, how that broader project works, I am still working through. I cannot give you a total and complete answer to that. But I think that this is an intellectual project that is profoundly important and an intellectual project that is, um, for, for me anyway, the project that I'm trying to engage in for the last, for, for the next 10 years or so. Thank you for listening. Thank you, uh, Professor Johnson. Thank you. Please, everyone, join me in a round of applause virtual with your uh, emoji or um, on camera uh, in thanking Professor Johnson for such an engrossing um, presentation. Um, and I'd like to now open up the floor to some questions. Uh, I haven't received any through the chat yet, but please do send those to me through the chat or by raising your hand. We have about uh, 15 minutes to address some questions before we move on to Professor Singleton's closing uh, remarks. So please do raise your hand uh, with the function that Zoom offers or uh, send me a question in chat. Otherwise I'll kick off, but I'll wait a few seconds to see if anyone has interest. No? Oh, yes, uh, Norman Hammond, would you like to unmute yourself? Oh, we can't hear you, you're still muted. We can't um, hear you, Norman. Oh, okay, there you go, yes. Okay, Matthew, can you hear me now? We can. Yeah, um, I'm interested in your revisionist account of the explanation of Mad Jack Fuller's Sugarloaf. Um, if you check page 57 of Arthur Mee's Sussex, um, it tells the traditional story that it was the result of a bet um, that he could see the spire of Dallington Church from um, his house. And he went home, found he was wrong, and swiftly had the sugarloaf whipped up on the horizon so that uh, he could show um, his um, uh, opponent that, in fact, he was right. Um, but you're saying that it's in fact an imitation of a West Indian sugar loaf. Um, uh, I, I, I was running short of time at that point, so let me let, let me let me clarify that. Um, I'm aware of that story, and um, there are clearly these two interpretations. I've seen both of them in different printed sources, given as as, as fact and as, as self-evident. What's clearly the case with 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 Fuller is is that there are these. These, these, these very different stories that are being told about him. Um, nevertheless, it is referred to as the Sugarloaf, and, it, and, and that, is, that is how it has gone down in popular tradition. So um, thank you for, being, for me being able to clarify that and give a little more detail on it. Thank you, Norman. Thank you, uh, Matthew. Any other questions? All right, um, I had a question. I was really interested by the reference you made uh, to Roger Williams, 1652, 
about the Indians in Wales, in Cornwall, and in Ireland. And it, I found it really striking, interesting that, that in a sense, this term Indian was being used to now kind of differentiate and or you know bring to the surface the differences of, of between the different people that inhabited the, the British Isles. And so I wanted to ask about that, but also the other side of the interactions with that larger Atlantic world. So when these landscapes are thrust into this larger Atlantic world, how they also began being defined in opposition uh, to the landscapes of the East and West Indies. Um, and so if that on the other side also led to a kind of entrenchment in local and regional British identities that perhaps smoothed over those differences, you know, when, when they're talking about those Indians of, of Cornwall and so on, were those also being smoothed over um, in opposition to the East and West Indies in a sense? That's, a, that's an interesting question, a very complex one. Um, my first reaction is, is a slightly random one, which is not about the East and West Indies, but actually about Australia. But one of the most intriguing place names you find from uh, early 19th century Britain is that of Botany Bay. Um, and this is a term that refers to a um, particular piece of land that, that are particularly infertile, or particularly hard work to cultivate. And clearly the, the, the thinking is, oh, it's as miserable working here as it is being a convict at, 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 at Botany Bay. Um, so is there an erasure going on? Um, yes, and um, I would I see Georgian architecture as in part about an erasure of history, and I mean that in a very direct and literal way. That you take these very complex and storied buildings and you plonk a facade on them. Um, does that? I feel I've I've only partly answered your question, Oliver. Do, do you want to come back on me on that? No, I mean that's uh, you, you already did did touch on it with with the. Uh, with the Georgian architecture, if you'd like to develop it a little more in, in terms of uh, other things, I'd be uh, excited to learn more, but we, we don't have that much time. So thanks for the answer. And I'll uh, let John Rubb now ask his question. Hi, Matthew. Good to see you. Um, I, I have a bunch of thoughts about what your about your very interesting presentation. Um, it's sort of you have a very deep time approach with the idea of the, the weight of the past generating the present and a kind of very practice-oriented thing. But then you also have, um, you were talking about things like an 18th century Protestant English horizon that cut across things and presumably was a kind of moment of horizontal formation. So in that sense, you have sort of horizons and you have depth and what I was sort of curious to know is what happens when a horizon meets a depth or what happens when a depth meets a horizon, if you see what I mean. Yes. I think you have a big old fight. Um, you have a, uh, and sometimes the horizon wins out and sometimes the depth wins out. And in a sense, the problem we've all been struggling with is to specify the circumstances in, what, in which one winds out and, and the circumstances in which something else wins out. And that is the very stuff and the very fabric of, of archeology. span I think to answer that in more specific terms, um, it seems to me, uh, and I'm gonna oversimplify hugely here, but, but I, I'm thinking about the, 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 the 1500s and the 1600s in terms of the persistence of particular kinds of regional traditions. And essentially they're, they're successfully fighting off some of the attempts to, to pull them into or to articulate them into, into a larger framework, between, particularly between different regions of, of the Isles um, versus the, uh, the, the success of the 18th century. And that is attributed in part to particular kinds of technologies, uh, print culture being, 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 being one, um, uh, mechanisms of the common law being another, um, all uh, so, so you know, literacy underpinning pinning both of those, but also more direct material technologies. I think in terms of this seminar, I would, I would, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in shipping. Mm. And I'm interested in thinking about the way in which, if I'm right, that, that you know, this, this is changing, to what extent is this 
down to the cold hard facts of communication times between people, which I, I've I've only been able to attend some of these talks, but I don't believe anybody's talked about in this 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 seminar series how long it actually takes from news and through information to get from one end of the the Atlantic world and another. And in that sense, the technology of shipping is really, really important in that context. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. I think there's a lot more we could say about that, but maybe on another occasion. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you both. Do we have a few more minutes? Any other questions, comments, ideas, reflections on Professor Johnson's interesting and fascinating uh, presentation? Um, Alessandra Cummins, is that a raised hand, I think? Yes. Yeah. I'm sorry to be so, you know, internal looking, but I was fascinated about the sundial and the particular uh, sites or ports that uh, were looked at, including Barbados. Did I get the date correctly? Was it 1715? No, 1757. Ah, because I, I think um, we should obviously tie this in with the uh, experimentation of, uh, of the various methodologies to achieve longitude and the whole process that Maskelyne and William and Harrison were involved in. Um, and just to say, I, 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 you know, it's fascinating because uh, also the one of the earliest sundials on the island was placed on the lawn of Codrington College, and I'm I'm interested in this association between the church, if you like, and and this whole business of time and and science. It's it's quite a I, I'm sorry to be inarticulate because it's not a field that I'm normally aware of, but I think I, I would like to explore that a lot further. Could you possibly comment on this? Thank you. That's um, sometimes you know, when you when you give a talk, you get an ideal question which invites you to speculate about something you didn't feel you could you could you had license to do in the talk. And thank you, uh, um, Professor Cummins, for, for doing exactly that. I like to think about what people saw when they looked up and they saw this thing. And I didn't have time to go through the statistics, um, but um, you know, this is a place that, first of all, you're, you're right, that, that the, I may have the date slightly wrong, but the, the, the Parliamentary Act to incentivize people to figure out longitude was 1714, I think. Um, and um, Harrison eventually gets paid off for it in 1790. So it's a process that, that, that unfolds between those, those, those two dates. Um, but there's a the uh, at almost exactly the same time as as the literacy rate is going from something, uh, according to some estimates, not all, it's a controversial matter, um, uh, around thirty percent to about seventy to eighty percent um, by the end of this period. So the question I'm moving towards is what did people see and how did they understand it, um, and um, I I think of this I have a mental picture of. Um, both men and women of different social classes and also children looking up at this thing and somebody maybe who had been to see, who understood the technical issues, explaining it to them. Um, and then in the very action of that explanation, you know, reinforcing certain kinds of, of social, social ideas, people talking about their experiences of going to see um, and so on. So I see this as a locus for, for different kinds of narrative that people have um, different social classes would, would have, have brought to this. Now it's in the countryside, it's not in the towns. So we're talking about different social classes. We're probably not talking about different ethnicities um, or, or, or people of different, different, different racial origins. Um, but um, as, as I said, there are, there, are very, there are a lot of very different people in Devon at this period. Does that, uh, does that provide a partial answer to your, your question? Yes, at least in part, although I would love you to speculate on this conjunction between science and the church, but for example, is right. there any any way of drawing out some connectivity there, or is it simply in the realm of the commissioner having decided what he wanted to see on the sundial and it being placed on the porch there? Um, 
it's it's a bit of both. Um, the the rector or the vicar of this church would have been a direct appointment, and as any reader of Jane Austen will know, um, these sort of appointments were pretty much in the gift of the local landowner. So if the local landowner wanted this place there, there would be very little. The 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 if he knew what was good for him, the 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 rector of the church would not um, would not object. The rectory is actually a little way off in the other direction. So you have the big house, then you have the um, the church, and then you have the the building. It's the rectory, a little bit downhill and, and quite a bit smaller than, than than the rectory. So there's a there's a very complex social gradation going on. Um, in this place. In terms of the relationship, in terms of knowledge, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, this is a period which in, I think in some senses is a decoupling of religious knowledge and, and, um, and, and secular knowledge. Um, in the 1600s, the, the project, and again, this is very controversial, but the, 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 the whole project of um, finding out about the world is conceived of in many places, not least in the University of Cambridge, as an explicitly Protestant project. And it, it is in part, at least in the earlier part of the 17th century, um, uh, an explicit project in part to bring about the millennium, to bring about the second coming. Um, so, but by the 18th century it's decoupled. So I'm thinking in real time as I'm talking to you and I'm thinking the way to think about it is actually in terms of a decoupling or a tension between these two different practices. Thank you, uh, Professor Johnson and Professor Cummins for that exchange. We have a comment from... No, uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, from Katie Whitaker, uh, just something of interest. Uh, Astronomer Royal Masculine is buried at my parish church. His large chest tomb stands next to the south porch, which has a plain sundial on it and a group of earlier scratch dials on the wall behind. I don't know if as a little conclusion, you have anything to, to comment on that, uh, Matthew? No, um, uh, it, um, uh, uh, Professor Whitaker, Katie, is, 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 is quite right to draw attention to earlier sundials, which of course go back, I think the earliest, uh, uh, the, the, I defer to the early medievalists in the audience, but they certainly go back into the earlier, uh, early Middle Ages, and the earlier ones are called mass dials. But, um, all right, thank you so much. And with that, I think we should move on and close. So please join me once again in thanking uh, Professor Johnson with a round of applause for his talk and for uh, answering your questions. Thank you very much. And um, with that, we will move on to uh, Professor Singleton. So Professor Singleton, who is professor in the Department of Anthropology, Syracuse University and current Pitt Professor of American History and Institutions at the University of Cambridge. Professor Singleton opened the series with the first seminar and will now address um, us with some closing reflections on the theme of the series. So Professor Singleton, uh, I hand it over to you. Can you see my screen? I, oh, okay. Um, I should say that it's this is more a review of the themes because I had to spend time uh, trying to remember <laughs> all the things. Well, not all the things, but some of the main um, ideas and to see for myself. And that I ended up uh, doing it in a PowerPoint because. Um, I don't know, it seemed like it was a little bit easier to see uh, the various themes and then the sub themes that, that went with it. Um, uh, certainly, the, I guess the major theme was the mobilities of, of people. And um, I sort of saw like three kinds of uh, Three, three major ways in which we were talking about the mobilities, you know, out migrations, certainly Africa, the main 
one, transatlantic slave trade. Um, I have England, um, I guess, going both to the, like the Caribbean, but also uh, to, to uh, Ireland and then Ireland, the dentures that went to the Caribbean. And then in um, North America, um, the main, I was one that I mentioned in my talk about Afro descendants leaving um, Nova Scotia and Philadelphia and going to other places. Um, Nova Scotia to Sierra Leone and then um, in Philadelphia to uh, Semana in the Dominican Republic in the 19th century. And then um, sort of in migrations uh, for Ireland, you have the English and the um, Highland Scots, the Sierra Leone, the Africans, uh, Liberia, the Afro Barbadians, which um, were talked about in, a, in two talks. And then um, in Ambia, the castle slaves and the liberated uh, Africans. And at least two places and probably more when you think about it more um, on a larger scale, um, places that have both um, in and out migrations. And Barbados, I have Barbados is, is, its land area is 439 square kilometers. And when I think of all those people going in and out that um, 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 Alessandra um, Cummings told us about, you know, it's, it seems so incredible. And, and yet I wonder if it's because of the size that that might have been why people came, um, came and stayed for a while, and then when things got uh, crowded, uh, went to other places, and then another group would come. Um, and then also the other place where you had in and out migrations was Gambia. Um, the more people were going out in terms of the slave trade doing the period the Gambia was important in the transatlantic slave trade. But, she, but um, Eliza Giganto also talks about the castle slaves. They really came from other parts of Africa. Um, and when, when they settled, and then also, um, I guess when Gambia becomes a colony or when the British start colonizing Gambia, it also became a designation for liberated Africans. So, so I, I found it interesting that these two relatively small places had in some ways a lot more migration, you know, people coming in and as well as uh, people leaving. Um, and uh, of course, there are various landscapes that we talked about, uh, the colonialist landscape at Ulster Plantation, um, a landscape of, of freedom, uh, La Bonga in, um, in um, uh, Colombia. And um, one of the things uh, that uh, Katarina uh, talked about was well, she mentioned this times in her paper how there's no hom homogeneity in terms of maroon settlements. And while I agree with that, I also um, was struck by, by the similarity of La Bonga to other, um, to other uh, maroon sites, um, the Quilombo Ambrosio, um, uh, which is in uh, Brazil, and Minas Gerais and um, Nanny Town um, in J Jamaica. So it, it's very much a similar situation where it's in the mountains and but, but surrounded by um, a small um, tributary or stream, stream of, of a river. And um, a commercial landscape at uh, Numi in um, Ghana. Um, there you had uh, 
relative within a relatively uh, short period of time, it becomes you know this commercial center, but then it doesn't. Uh, it's I, th I think its whole history is about uh, a century that that it becomes a, an important um, um, commercial landscape and. Um, Liza Gidanto mentions how it you know, had a very swift rise and then uh, decline. And then the enduring landscapes that we, the English landscape that uh, Matt, um, Matthew Johnson, Professor Johnson just mentioned uh, to us uh, how you have these landscapes that really are you know, so many years well, several centuries, and, and yet they're uh, still, still with us in many ways. And then there's the hidden landscapes in Barbados that um, enslaved people um, occupied, the gullies, uh, and the caverns, uh, almost like a subterranean type of uh, landscape. And then the maritime landscapes that were mentioned um, in Northeastern um, Ryan Epperson um, talks about North, the Northeastern Caribbean, but, but also um, talks about the um, maritime in, in, in Ireland. Um, and uh, one, one interesting thing uh, was that uh, about the, I, I thought she said coconuts were in under the ships, and I had that on the list of props, but I took it off. I said I must have been daydreaming <laughs> about the Caribbean. But I listened to her uh, lecture right before, and in there were they did find coconuts, but I didn't get a date as to when that how old that uh, shipwreck was. But that, but I just thought that was really interesting that uh, there are you know coconuts in in Ireland I mean at that time period and then um, trade relationships um, we talked uh, I, well, well of course uh, most of the discussion on the transatlantic slave trade and the Atlantic trade was was legal. Um, the uh, illegal trade, um, Ryan talked about um, the legal and illicit um, being more privateering and then um, piracy being illegal and illicit. Um, but one thing I wanted to just sort of interject um, with that discussion and, and then also uh, Audrey talked a little bit about um, the illegal um, illicit trade in, in terms of Ireland. Um, and that was, and that is the article written by um, Harnett and um, Dowdy, um, the archeology span of listed economies. And in that, they seem to feel that, um, uh, well, they, well, they, one of their categories that they're looking at is smuggling. And they see smuggling as something that was illegal, but licit, you know, because there was this um, wide acceptance for get, getting smuggled um, goods. And so um, I'm thinking that uh, at least in terms of Ryan's um, ongoing project, that maybe this is another thing or another direction or uh, way of framing um, the, the illegal uh, trade to look at. Because it seems to me that some of the privateering sort of fits in that uh, category. It was legal, but perhaps some people, in, and it was illicit, they were doing illicit uh, trading, but for some people, it might have been considered, uh, you know, uh, 
listed because of, uh, you know, they, they turned the other way, you know, they didn't um, criticize it or, or anything um, like that. Um, we talked a lot about our identities, or at least um, some people more than, than others. Um, and so there were a number of ethnogenesis and hybrid identities. The um, Plancaros um, would be one, the um, Lusco African, the Black Englishman, um, the person who had the various types of clothing that for which uh, Audrey said, if you were to see him, if, if people were to see him at the time, they wouldn't be able to really know how his identity because he had clothing that's associated with different, uh, you know, different groups of, of people. And then she also talked about uh, shifting identity um, in terms of, particularly in, in terms of religious identity um, after the uh, colonization of, um, of, of, of Ireland. And, um, and, and then in the end, um, after about 1640s, I believe, you have these uh, transplanted Irish identities um, going um, particularly to, to the Caribbean. And then this is just a partial list of uh, the com commodities, the human commodities would be the enslaved people. Um, I was really struck by the whole uh, role tobacco played in, um, in, in, in um, among the, the Yoruba or the Oyo um, kingdom and or empire. And the fact that Tobacco, um, Akeem mentioned how tobacco actually um, served as a, a commodity that had a very strict class access. In, in, in other words, the access you had to tobacco um, was to somehow was somehow dependent on um, on your uh, class status. Um, and then calories, guns, um, beads, and alcohol. And, and I think in some of the questioning, people um, looking at Gambia and um, and Nigeria, how different, how how these commodities were different. Tobacco was very important in the oil uh, kingdom, but in the Gambia. Uh, alcohol seems to have been a much more important um, commodity that came via the um, Atlantic trade. Then uh, textiles and um, textiles here and Venetian glass were two that Audrey mentioned um, from Ireland. And then there several forms of forced labor, transatlantic slavery, the castle slavery, domestic slavery, and then of course indentured uh, servitude. So those were at least um, four types of labor, forced labor that we talked about in terms of looking at the uh, uh, mobilities and um, and, and the people moving through the Caribbean and, and through into um, in a, um, and across the Atlantic. And then the um, end mobilities, uh, you know, what uh, I, uh, Professor um, Dodson just gave us perhaps the most um, detailed. Uh, discussion of the immobilities, but there are other hints that other, some of the other papers provided, um, like enduring uh, social structures uh, that you see in, in all these places that kept some people 
um, from being able to um, move um, physically, but then also just socially, the social immobility um, that was so um, brought out in the uh, G of a quote about sl enslaved people having um, limited ability around. Uh, the red legs, they would also were a, a people, um, and, and as I understand, having um, read um, Matt Riley's book, that even today, the, uh, the descendants of um, the red legs, you know, many of these, many of them still have a very um, hard life. I mean, they're, uh, uh, you know, eke out a living as best uh, they can. Um, then the um, African, the vast majority of Africans who really had little access to this trade. So a lot of these goods we're talking about, um, so many of the vast majority of, of the African people um, had uh, very little access, as we could tell from um, archaeological uh, research. And then um, another group, uh, uh, African, the African Americans in Seminar in the Dominican Republic, uh, one of their concerns has been that they were, you know, they were able to move there, but then it was moving away that they still see um, obstacles um, because they are pretty much, um, um, have experienced a lot of alienation historically um, in the Dominican Republic. So that's um, sort of the themes. I guess uh, I was thinking, well, what things have we not covered and again, Professor Johnson mentioned the um, uh, about communication and how long did it take people to learn about what was going on in the world. Um, another thing we really none of the top papers address was the extent to which uh, gender played a role. In mobilities, you know, so many of the people that were discussed, and you know, I'm I'm guilty of this as well, um, were um, men. You know, what what about women? You know, were they often you know just left behind in certain cases where they could um, potentially migrate uh, or go somewhere else? Um, so, so those are the two things that I feel like might need more attention in, in the future. But uh, I'd say all in all, I, I, when I first heard about uh, this theme, I, I kept thinking, well, is there going to be much we can say about mobilities? Oftentimes, particularly from an archaeological point of view, because uh, in order to have an archaeology, people have to have resided at a place for a while to have much of a, uh, you know, um, um, an you know archaeological deposit. So if you're looking at mo well, we, well, we're not looking at short-term mobility. We're looking at long-term mobilities. So in that area, we're uh, strong. Is uh, there's a lot of data for archaeology. Um, investigation, but it's still the short-term mobilities that we probably need some ways of thinking about how do you deal with the fact that this community was here for just a few months or or that, you know, and, and trying to tease that out from, from archaeology can be uh, quite difficult. So that's... <laughs> Those are my uh, reflections. Thank you, Marjorie Singleton. Um, and 
thank you for that reflection and for bringing together the different talks. And I think Josh and I are encouraged by the transatlantic connections this series has facilitated. And, and I think we do hope for more opportunities to interact this way across countries and regions and reflect on the shared and different dynamics of mobility and immobility, and also that hopefully future um, engagements like this can build on, on your recommendations that you that you mentioned there at the end, Professor, Professor Singleton. Um, so now Josh and I would like to bring the Garrett Seminar Series to a close, and we would like to thank uh, everyone who has attended our talks throughout the, the three months <laughs> that we have been running them, um, and also to all of our speakers. Um, all of our speakers, uh, of course, Teresa Singleton, Joanna Caterina Mantilla, uh, Ryan Esperson, Alessandra Cummins, Akin Ogundiran, Liza Gijanto, uh, Audrey Horning, and Matthew Johnson. Thank you very much. And Josh, I pass it on to you. Uh, yeah, uh, I just want to, um, we'd also like to thank everyone who has been involved uh, with the organization, uh, including the Cambridge Heritage uh, Research Center, Anna O'Mahony, uh, Emma Jarman, Laura Cousins, Liz Demeray, Paul Lane, uh, Laura Bonner, uh, Matthew Davies, and uh, Cyprian Broodbank. And um, thank you all once again. Um, uh, join me in a final round of applause. Uh, Oliver and I encourage you also to attend next term's uh, talks and I'll put that link there. Thank you so much, everyone.